All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not All Propaganda is Art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, August 21st, 1921, the largest relief effort in the world up to that point is mounted. After 10 days of negotiation to plan the effort, in early September, late summer, dozens of American ships start arriving in Russian ports, carrying 700 tons of food, mostly corn, which was then used to feed children in cities throughout Russia. Uh, This program was starting now. It would run for a while. By the next summer, summer of 1922, the American food program had fanned out across Russia, was feeding some 11 million Russians a day. This food program was largely the work of Herbert Hoover, who in the time since the end of World War I had made food assistance one of his major priorities. He saw it both as a noble humanitarian effort, but also a political cudgel. Uh, Food will win the war was his slogan. So let's talk about the U.S.-Russia food aid nexus and also this really interesting part of Hoover's career that I didn't really know too much about it. I don't think I really thought of him as a as a food guy to become a foodie as a result of this. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) But here to do that, as always, are Nicole Hammer of Vanderbilt and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Uh, Do we want to start? Kind of bigger picture with like Hoover and um, his role in food aid, particularly coming out of World War One. Um, it really was quite a remarkable effort. Hoover really was known in this era as a, a kind of, if not philanthropist, then like a, a man who was out there healing the world in some ways, that he was bringing food to war-torn places, places like Belgium, making sure that Americans economized so that there would be food available to help out U.S. allies during World War I to make sure that people who didn't have enough had enough, um, which was really his legacy uh, going into the 1920s. And I think really bolsters sort of the status of the United States as being like Mm -hmm. the breadbasket to the world Mm -hmm. when we think about the center of the country. All of this production is going into food production, uh, corn, wheat, so on and so forth. So all of that's being outsourced to the rest of the world and and really elevating the status of, of Americans and what Americans can contribute contribute to other countries. Yeah, you know, he's um, under Wilson. Uh, President Wilson Hoover is brought as the U.S. Food Administrator. And then there's a number of programs, uh, Commission for the Relief of Belgium being one of them, but, you know, and then the American Relief Administration, the ARA. And I don't know, in it, in, in some way, this kind of reminds me or makes me think of the Marshall Plan in a sense, you know, mm-hmm. and I mean, such, you know, and we know so much about the efforts mm-hmm. in the wake of World War Two to kind of rebuild Europe and, and stay in Europe. And this was a really this was a massive effort um, in, in the same spirit, I think, but focused particularly on food. Um, you mentioned, you know, kind of Hoover's approach to this. Uh, and you talked about the idea of economizing this effort. And so he was seen as a humanitarian, but I would say more than anything, he was seen as a pretty good 
uh, bureaucrat. And this is where, <laughs> and in, in these food administration programs, we get the phrase to hooverize, which is kind of to mm. find maximum efficiency. And the kind of bureaucrat that wouldn't have been possible in the United States before this moment. Yeah. You yeah. have to have a, a country that is deeply involved in world affairs in order to uh, have this kind of outreach into France and Belgium and ultimately into Russia, but also a a federal government that's big enough to coordinate these kinds of national efforts. And this really is a result, in a way, of a progressive movement that had been growing the size of the federal government, but really of this state of total war that the U.S. goes into when it enters World War One. It's not just about building up the military, it's not just about moving troops, but it's about reorienting the entire economy to help fight this war, including agriculture, which is where he's kind of the the head guy. This is an interesting um, fact to me, too, because the the famine that Russia is experiencing is not like a result of, of drought or some sort of, you know, natural disaster. This is basically brought on by war, the Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, you know, the railroad systems that distributed food all throughout the country efficiently basically were dysfunctional and it wreaked havoc on the country. I mean, 5 million people died because of this famine, because of this inability to get food sent to them properly. A lot of this is in Russia, but also in parts of southern Ukraine. And so there's a huge rush to get as many resources and food as possible um, to people so that more people don't die. Yeah. And this is where your analogy to the Marshall Plan really holds up, Jody, because the idea behind the Marshall Plan was if you shore up these countries in Europe, mm-hmm. they won't fall to communism, they won't become socialist countries. And that was part of Hoover's thinking as well, that Russia had just been through this revolution, and you needed to stabilize the country lest it become even more radical and spread its revolution even further. Um, and he talks about this, that that the food aid was in part to stem the tide of Bolshevism, um, mm-hmm. that you're fighting not only to save lives, but you are fighting to defeat anarchy, which he calls the handmaiden of hunger. So there was Mm. this broader political aim packaged into the relief. But it is a little more complicated here because the Bolsheviks are, you know, in power and Lenin is like, there's this famine that's taking place. And so, you know, the the calculus is interesting, which is, you know, Mm -hmm. obviously, I mean, you know, there's the humanitarian side of this, which is let's let's help a country that is experiencing a deep famine. But, you know, it is a country whose government we wouldn't mind failing. Um, and mm. so it's a little like helping this country then also helps, um, you know, our political enemies. Mm-hmm. But the other side of it and the way I think Hoover sort of squared it is also saying, well, you know, if the United States can come in and provide humanitarian relief and make the argument that our system, our country is best suited and that the Americans have come to your aid, then that Mm -hmm. undermines um, the Bolsheviks as well. And, you know, no surprise, both sides um, kind of spin this and use this and frame this in, Mm -hmm. in whatever way is politically expedient, including, you know, I would say that it appears to be that within Russia, the kind of negotiations to have this food aid program go into place were kind of done behind the main government apparatus's back. Um, and, a, and a group of non-Bolsheviks kind of negotiated the permission to make an international plea and have Hoover respond with uh, developing this program. And he sends tons of food, tons of food and supplies, actually 4 million tons of food and supplies. I mean, this is a billion dollars of relief in the 1920s, like that's a billion dollars is unheard of in the 1920s. Um, so that kind of like constant, you know, huge supply influx into the country. Um, Hoover hopes that this will really be like a boon, a show of good faith, a way of, of, of sort of conjoling the Russians to his favor. But um I don't think we realize, again, how big this program was. I certainly didn't think of it as being this big in the 1920s. It's also worth noting that he had a teach a man to fish kind of approach to all of this, which is that he wanted to get food aid there immediately in order to help 
Russian people who didn't have food. But he also wanted to make sure that he was sending along um, things like wheat that produce seed that would allow them to begin to grow their own food in mm-hmm. fields that had laid fallow um, and in places where the famine really was rooted in agricultural failure. Um, so there was a, a long view that was baked into this program. Mm-hmm. Um, the Russians, you know, as I was, as we were saying, kind of remain a little wary of this they know they need the help but they as they negotiate this there's certain factions within that even the russian negotiating party who are kind of like looking sideways at the united states saying what do you, you know what are you up to with these efforts and it's again it's this mix of both realizing that there's a humanitarian effort here and realizing that there's all this sort of deep political um diplomacy or you know political ad- adversarial relationship going on here including you know one of the russian officials negotiating this one of lenin's officials are ne- negotiating this says you know repeatedly kind of is quoted as saying, gentlemen, we recognize that food is a weapon, you know, and we Mm. recognize that there's more here than just food, which is funny because, I mean, Hoover himself had Mm. kind of said food will win the war. So both sides are like (laughs) saying, like, you know what's really going on here, right? Um, But then they're also um, providing this this relief. Um, To paint a picture of how this plays out, you know, the, you, the the amount of food that's sent to the nursery, but also the amount of Americans. And so this idea that in mm. the t- 1921, 1922, there are just hundreds and hundreds, thousands, I think, of young American men, many of them who had just fought in World War One, And now all of a sudden they're in Russia doing, you know, kind of soup kitchens and food aid and, and, and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And it's just quite a place to imagine a um, World War One veteran finding themselves. Well, and it has an early... Peace Corps yep. feel mm-hmm, to it, right? Mm-hmm. That Americans are going to go there as a show of goodwill. And it's also, I mean, at least part of it is a reallocation of resources after the war. Again, you had this total war. You suddenly had all of this food production in the United States. You had mm-hmm. agricultural surplus in the U.S. that could have wrecked and eventually did wreck the farm economy in the U.S. So you're able to get to move the surplus food to reallocate some of these folks who are already abroad to Russia to help out there. Uh, a lot of the ARA workers, the American Relief Administration workers who were sent over there, um, did feel like they were caught in a political game. They complained of mm. a lot of surveillance and that there was spying, which there probably was, um, of, of their activities <laughs> yeah. there. Uh, one tidbit worth noting is that um, 26 of them came home with Russian brides. So there you go. Ah! You know, you, you, there you go. You fight a war, you do some humanitarian work. You meet the love of your life. You come back to the United States. It's 1922. What could possibly go wrong back home in 1922? Go next. What trouble could they possibly get into? Um, but yes, that crazy. is a nice little tidbit here. Um, so as we wrap up, let's let's talk about the sort of Hoover side of this because, you know, you read this, you're like, okay, here's this guy who knows how to get food mm. to people who need it in the, fa- mm. in the face of uh, economic desperation. Most people know Hoover as the guy who kind of botched the Great Depression. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I know I'm being I know I'm being a little uh, you know a little flip here, but does this no, say anything real. about kind of what do we make of Hoover and why was he mm. maybe not able to mount this sort of similar response at, at, on the home front? I mean, at least part of it is that Hoover had this conservative philosophy that, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe the U.S. had a role to play out in the world to help starving people, but Americans needed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and that private agencies and organizations needed to step forward in times of crises. And so he had all of this humanitarian and bureaucratic and organizational experience, and he kind of sat on his hands Mm. um, because he, not entirely, I mean, we're painting with a broad brush, but, you know, he doesn't put it to use in the same way because he doesn't believe that that's the role that the federal government should play within the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And the scale. I mean, when I think about the huge scale that he sent to Russia and the scale of which he's sending aid or or applying effort to the Great Depression is just pales in comparison. Um, He's not putting, allocating a whole lot of money and resources towards relieving um, the Great Depression, certainly not in the same way that that FDR does uh, right after him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it does get politicized in the moment and then in the years subsequent and through Hoover's administration. And also, you know, well, one specific way is I think Russians start to claim that, you know, Americans are in some way they start to imply that Americans are responsible for the famine in some way, you know, and so I think that becomes a story that's being told. But, you know, to me, you look at this story and I think you look at a lot of stories coming out of we think of we kind of maybe think of the story of 
the Cold War as beginning in the wake of World War II. And I think you can mm-hmm. see that so many of the seeds, so to speak, are being planted here, right? And um, this cold diplomacy, um, this skepticism, looking at each other sideways, but also this need to realize that we are two emerging superpowers. And, you know, this incident here really did carry through. I mean, even in 1959, 30 years later, a number of different you know, regimes later, obviously after World War II. But Khrushchev, when he came to the United States on his famous trip in 1959, talked about the ARA relief and talked about remembering that. But then he also kind of did the thing where he was like, yeah, but that also maybe caused a famine and, you know, like just just sort of the (laughs) political positioning and so forth. But Mm -hmm. I think um, this helps us remember to sort of wind the clock back of the Cold War to really after Mm -hmm. World War I um, in, in an interesting way. Mm-hmm. I like that. We're going to call it the long cold war. Yeah. And we're yeah. Credit you. yeah, yeah. But at least for now, Hoover sort of gets a little bit of a feather in his cap. Maybe. Oh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, let's. I think that's the goal of this episode is to take a feather and just pluck it into Hoover's cap ever so gently. Uh, and if we've done that. We've done our job. Um, but yeah, super, super fascinating. That brings us to the end of this episode. And now when you think Hoover, think food. Food will win the war. There you go. All right. Food will win the war. Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you as always. My pleasure.